So I think my favorite part of the EXO conference is getting to spend the day with my husband and just learning new and fresh things to keep our marriage like on top. Yeah, it's just great hearing everyone's stories and hearing that there's no such thing as a perfect relationship, that it takes two to make the marriage work. Yeah. So if you've been thinking about it, and if you are seriously dating or newly married, or even if you've been married forever, go on and register today because you will not regret it. It is a fun-filled day. Better get on it. You're building a foundation for your kids to have a godly example. Whatever your past has been, God can, can redeem, he can set free, he can heal. Good morning. Who's going to XO? Signed up? Oh, wow. Everyone's in second service today. Or you guys all went to first service too, and then you know, like collided in. Who, uh, who wants to go to XO, but you haven't signed up yet, but you're like, I'm going to sign up this week or today or right now? No one? Everyone's scared? All right. Men, pull out your phones, get signed up uh, for XO. Trust me. Uh, it pays dividends in the end and uh, in the bedroom that night, okay? You're going to learn a lot of great things. Um, God wants to bless your marriage, give you uh, tools and resources. Um, even if you feel like you have a great marriage, my wife and I have, uh, I think this will be our fourth or fifth year um, going to the EXO conference. Um, I feel like we have a pretty decent marriage. I don't know what she thinks, but... We learn things every time we go. There's great speakers, um, just an interactive time uh, with, your, with your spouse and um, other couples. So get signed up. You can go to the central hub uh, to do that. All right. Uh, the second thing I want to hit real quick, we have a, a team in Guatemala heading to Guatemala. They actually, I think, just got on a flight at... Uh, 10.15, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. Yep, 10.15. I think they're going to get there at like 12.55. So they're on the flight down to Guatemala City. It's Pastor Joe Allen, Jeremy Dare, Carrie Fess, Greg Fess, Derek Kennedy, Montana LaRoche, and Matthew Wells. They're going to be down there for the, the week in Guatemala City. Oh, yeah, there's a picture of them. And ministering to the, the people down there. There's a conference where... 300 to 400 area pastors are coming in, and they, they get to disciple, minister to them. And Carrie, Carrie, Pastor Kerry and Pastor Matthew will be speaking at that conference. They're going to be visiting hospitals, um, a few construction projects. But I just wanted to lift them up in prayer this morning. And if you would just pray where you're at, I'll lead us, and we'll pray for them as they go throughout the week. Father, we thank you for our team heading, heading on, the, on the plane right now to Guatemala City, Lord. And I just pray that you would keep them safe, that you would uh, protect their, their flight. And whenever they land down in Guatemala City, Lord, that there would be safe transportation for them in and out. That you would walk with them throughout this week and that the people of Guatemala City would be open to hearing your word as you speak through our team, Lord, for your honor and your glory, Lord. And I pray that the pastors coming in, that they would be encouraged and refreshed by the words that Carrie and, and Pastor Matthew are going to speak to them, Lord, and that maybe a renewing of their hearts and their minds as they go out and they minister and disciple other peoples in that area, Lord. And we just pray for health over them, safety, and a safe return. I pray for the, the families that are still here in Fort Scott, Lord that you would give them uh, just an extra sense of peace this week being back home, that things would go smoothly, that nothing would break down, no car troubles, no home problems, Lord, that it's just a smooth week. Kids back in school, and there would just be a blessing over them as their spouses are gone and, and their daughters are gone, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for that team and that their, their hearts to serve, not just here, but people in different countries, Lord, and that uh, you're the same God here as you are there, and they're just taking the word down there and, and being obedient and doing your work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, 
My name's Jerry. If we haven't met, I have a few different roles here at the church. My family and I, we have been attending Faith Church for uh, a little over 10 years now. Um, and my wife and I will be celebrating our 10-year anniversary actually next month. So, hey, XO works. Go to XO. September 7th. Sign up. I think we got a picture of, oh, there they are. Yep. That's my family. Most of you know him. Uh, Boston there. He's uh, mommy's boy. Bryn uh, is on my arm. She's daddy's girl. Um, that little blonde-headed one next to the mom at the bottom, he's the reason I had gray hairs before I turned 30. And then little Breck down there in the wagon, she, she runs the household. She just tells us what to do. She can talk now. She just tells us what to do, and we just do it because uh, she's the boss. Uh, I help with the, the youth um, here, but uh, it wouldn't be possible without um, just some amazing youth leaders that invest into your kids week in and week out, um, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week too, talking to them, texting them, encouraging them as they go throughout the week, and just showing up with joy and laughter and fun each time we meet. And that's Adam and Susie Castleberry, Mindy Ingstrom, Levi and Shelby Reichard, Chloe Simpson, and Clay and Rita Wheeler. Also help with our, our facility. And if you uh, are familiar with uh, Dwight Belcher and Thomas Coyne, they show up each week on Wednesdays just dancing and singing right into the doors. They are ready to get in here and help clean this place, help clean the bathrooms. Those dudes have uh, servant hearts, and I love them for that. And a lot of wisdom, too, that uh, they share with me, and I listen, and uh, I take it all in. I'm just like, uh, thank you, Lord, for blessing them here. And we are super thankful that uh, they, uh, they just love Jesus, and it's apparent every day on their, on their hearts. And then the third thing, I help with the, the finances just stewarding those with, along with pastor and our board of elders, um, just uh, God's mission, his work, um, to put those funds uh, where he is leading us to use those. Um, today we're going to be in Psalm 119. It is the longest chapter in the Bible. It takes roughly 22 minutes to read. I know that because it takes 20 minutes from my house to get here, and then I have to wait two minutes in the parking lot to finish it. It's an acrostic pattern that combines elements of a wisdom psalm and an individual lament psalm. Each stanza of the psalm contains lines that in the Hebrew text all start with the same Hebrew letter. This continues throughout the psalm until all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are used. It focuses on a two-ways motive, the concept of following Yahweh's ways, or the way of the wickedness. In the transformative role of submission to Yahweh's instruction and the desperate need for Yahweh's help. This psalm is an intimate communion with God, discussing God's word with him and hearing back from God about his word. Most of the psalm is in the form of a prayer, asking God to speak to the psalmist. Charles Spurgeon wrote it like this about Psalms 119, and I feel like it gives us a wonderful insight into what we are going to read today. Listen to this. This wonderful psalm from its great length helps us to wonder at the immensity of scripture. For it keeps keep for, from it from its keeping to one subject, it helps us to adore the unity of scripture. For it is but one. Yet from the many turns it gives to the same thought, it helps you to see the variety of scripture. Some have said that in it there is no absence of writing, but that is merely the observation of those who have not studied it. I have weighed each word and looked at each syllable with lengthened meditation, and I bear witness that this sacred song has no tautology or repetitiveness in it, but is charmingly varied from beginning to end. 
Its variety is that of a kaleidoscope. From a few objects, a boundless variation is produced. In the kaleidoscope, you look once, and there is a strangely beautiful form. But you shift the glass a very little, and another shape, equally delicate and beautiful, is before your eyes. So it is here. Turn with me to Psalm 119. We're going to start out in verse 1 and read through verse 11. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statues and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I, then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I, lean, as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's our main point today. And if you get nothing else out of this, write this down. There's true life in God's word. There's a better way to say this. There's a blessed life to aligning our lives in God's word. What's blessed? Blessed is this deep inner joy that we walk with when we know that our lives are aligning with his word. It's a confidence that we walk in day in and day out knowing I know what God's word is. I'm in his word. I'm aligning my life to his words. Everything I'm doing is trying to take the, the words in this text and, and apply them to my life. I'm, I see uh, how Jesus lived and what he did for us, and I want to be like that. I want to love like Jesus loved, and we, we walk with this joy that we have knowing that we're abiding in God and that he's leading us. The first verse, it says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. This blameless is... Uh, uh, the word undefiled or pure is used in some of your text. But the, the uh, funny thing is we, we like to live a defiled life sometimes, don't we? We don't want to just be the, the goody good Christian life all the time. There's no fun in that. There's no fun in, uh, you know, doing the right thing all the time. We still want to, we want to give God this hand, which, uh, here, God, you control this. I'll let you control, you know, a few things here, a few things there. But in this hand, I want to still control the, the finances. And I want to control uh, who I hang out with and, and the, the things I watch still, Lord. But I am giving you this, but um, I want to keep this. And we go back and forth, and we live in this cycle of living for God and it, it, it has no growth or maturity because we're still holding on to sin. And we're, we're, we're trying to balance and juggle all these different things in the world that's throwing at us. And the scriptures are telling us that, look at, look at verse uh, 33 through 37. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statues and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things and give me life through your word. God's commands are better than any worldly freedoms. There's nothing in the world or there's nothing that the world offers that God doesn't offer that's better. Now, the enemy will uh, uh, kind of flip this in our heads, and we'll, we'll have things uh, that we think are better in the world. We'll have things that uh, we think are, are better our way, um, or maybe just sin confusion our way. Um, when I was thinking about this and studying over this, I think there's a, a lot of times that 
We give the, the enemy's voice. We let the enemy have a louder voice than God's voice. We let the enemy's lies think that they can uh, just get into our, our minds. I, I've heard, uh, I think Vicki Shedd has said it like this before, that the enemy will, will throw lies at us, and it's like tiny little arrows, and they just kind of like hit off your, your, your mind right here, your brain, and just flop to the ground. But really, we'll, we'll, we'll picture it as like it's like there's a, a, a cannonball gun right here just like taking direct shots at our head, and we just let them come in, and then the mountain's so big and the giants are so big that we can't move forward, and then uh, we have no confidence, and then uh, we're, we're depressed, and, and, and we have anxiety, and we worry about everything, and we worry about this, and how am I going to pay for this, and uh, they're talking about this, and then we get into gossip, and then we have no discipline in anywhere, anywhere areas of our lives because we're letting the enemy's voice that has no power be louder than God's voice that has all the power. Logos, a Bible study platform with over 100,000 theological resources. It's actually a great website. It does cost money, but it's a great website for any Bible studying. Um, just has a ton of resources. They did a study and found that although 87 of adult households in the United States said they owned at least one Bible in their home, only 11% of those surveyed said they have read the entire Bible once, while 30% said they've only read a few passages or stories. So just picking and choosing what we need in certain seasons of our lives. Picking and choosing when we want God to come in. Picking and choosing, uh, okay, Lord, yeah, I, I, I messed up pretty bad this time. Can you bail me out again? You want to know when my life truly, truly changed? When I quit treating him as our Father in heaven, as a transactional God, and let him be the transformational God. It's not just trans, a transaction machine that we're at with their God. And I know this. I've, I've lived my life like that. He wants to come in and transform us. He wants to transform our hearts. He wants to transform the way we, we read this, these words that are alive and active, that have power over all the, the anger and, and depression and anxiety he wants to transform our hearts to, to love people better and see people in his eyes and his ways. He wants to give us a, a joy and a confidence that we can walk with every single day. That Jesus paid the price for our sins so we don't even have to carry it anymore. And often we do. We often carry sin around in shame and guilt. And really God just sitting right there waiting, hey, give that to me. I've taken care of it. We just repent, get right with God again, and come back to his words that are alive and active and a realign our lives with him. I grew up on a, on a farm. Um, if you grew up on a farm, you know that there's a lot of uh, words that are um, transactional words used on a farm when you're working cattle and doing different things verbally, sometimes encouraging, most of the time not. Um, <clears throat> You learn, to, you learn to work hard. There's a work ethic that's been instilled in me uh, by, by my dad and my parents and being on the farm that, you know, you just get things done. If it needs to get, be done, you, just, you get it done. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's 110 degrees outside. So we're going to work cattle or we're going to fix fence. And... Through this process that I, I, I love the work ethic that the, my, my younger years uh, growing up in the farm instilled in me, but it gave me a, a false um, perspective 
on God, and I was always trying to earn God's love. Trying to live my life just to make it to heaven. Working hard in in every area. Okay, I gotta I gotta earn something. I gotta work hard. If if I, there's sin in my life, it's because I wasn't working hard enough. And it's not about uh, just knowing the the facts in the Bible. Facts are good. It helps us give us context. But it's about living life from God's perspective. I don't think God really cares if we know if it was Cain or Abel who killed who. If we're not living our life according to his word. If there's not a transformational life that we're living. I don't think he cares if we know if uh, who was Abraham's uh, son that he was going to sacrifice before God stopped him, if our life isn't being transformed by the words in this text. So we can have a ton of Bible knowledge, and there's two, two, uh, two sides of this coin. We've either been around the Bible our entire lives, and we know all the stories and all the characters of the Bible, and we have it tucked in our heart, but we're either uh, not sharing it or discipling others, or we just come stagnant in our growth. God has something new to reveal every time we open the Bible, no matter how long we've been reading it. And then the other side is we, uh, we don't know the Bible very well. Maybe we're, we're a new Christian, and we get timid almost and scared to talk about our faith or you're hanging around other people, that uh, other Christians because you think you're going to like mess something up or say something that's not biblically correct, and then you're just going to be like shunned and like, oh, they don't read their Bible. They didn't know that. And so we get scared and, and, and intimidated to speak out and, and really share what's on our hearts and what God's speaking to us. God speaks to us in so many different ways, so many different ways. Uh, I love this about my, my wife. She can she can get an image of something, and God will just start speaking to her through it. I remember one time we were, drive, we're on a road trip. We were driving down the highway, and there was a uh, silo bin, one of the old ones with, like, the tops that had uh, fallen off. And so, and, but then there was a tree that was growing out of it, and then it was, like, uh, coming out the top. And she's seen it, and she's like, oh, wow, like, does that mean anything to you? I was like, oh, it looks like a tree growing, you know, out through a silo bin. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's just what it looks like to me. And it gets a little sun, you know, here and there during the day. And I guess it's enough to let it, let it grow out. And she's like, oh, wow. It looks, I mean, I just got an image of like, it's like when we're going through hard times and, uh, you know, it, it seems real dark and, and, and like, how are we going to get out of here? And then God's light comes in. Just a little bit of light helps us grow. And then eventually, if we just keep holding on, then we'll blossom and we'll get through the trials and we'll, you know, we'll succeed and, and, and we'll be right with God again. And I'm like, yeah, it just looks like a tree growing out of a silo bin. <laughs> she does this all the time, and I love her for it because it helps my perspective and just having that little uh, kid imaginary, you know, the mind of how God works and how he moves. We joke a lot. I see a lot of a text in black and white where I can just like take it and read it, which is uh, not a great place to be all the time either because it can lead to legalism and uh, this is what the word says and says like that, don't take it out of context. And, and, and I think it's okay that God will speak to us in many different ways. But we have to be in his word to be able to hear his voice. Because if we're not in his word, then we're not familiar with his voice. Look at Hebrews 4.12 real quick. I never thought I would be running out of time, but we're going to have to rush through this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit 
joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. What is this saying? The sharpness and precision of God's word can pierce the deepest parts of our being. Separating what's truly spiritual and what's faithless, the word is your weapon. Here, listen to this. Conviction of sin, pride, lying, lust, anger, greed, envy, gossip, jealousy, all things that we struggle with and go through, the word acts like a sword cutting through our self-deception. Because oftentimes we don't realize we're living in the sin until we get into the word. And we sure aren't listening to someone else tell us that we have a problem with jealousy or anger or lust. We get into the word and the word starts slicing off all these things that are faithless in us so we can live in union with him. Two, transformation of character. You may come to James 1, 19 through 20, which says, everyone should be slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. There needs to be meditation on these words and true conviction. As we do, the sword of truth pierces the heart, putting death to anger, which changes our behavior. You can keep going on, spiritual discernment, Galatians 1.10, and now I am trying to win the approval of human beings. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Wow. That one hit me pretty hard because um, I've been a, a people pleaser for a long time in my life. And I've actually, I have this scripture highlighted and underlined in my Bible. And then last night when I was going through and adding uh, this in to my outline, I came to Galatians 1.10 and it hit me like it's never hit me before. It's like I was blinded to the words before and then I, I read it while I was sitting there praying and reading and it was like a, it was like God revealed, like opened my eyes and revealed these words to me in a way that has never been before. To say, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Wow. It's in his word that we study and he reveals things to us. Guidance and decision making. This is a big one. Word, the word of God acts like a sword cutting through the confusion and bringing clarity. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So now it's not solely on us, but we're bringing God back into the equation. Maybe it's encouragement in times of doubt. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. The sword of truth cuts through the feelings of weakness, bringing us back to hope and endurance. I think sometimes we, we overcomplicate uh, kind of our, the Christian walk and Christian life. We feel like we have to have uh, everything figured out or we have to kind of fake it here and at church, and then we can be different at home. Um, we feel like, uh, I'm not going to say that, but I think we should realize and just start meditating more that God loves you. That's never going to change, no matter how far we get off the, the tracks, how far we get off the road. Christ died for your sins. Wow. There's true repentance that we must come back to because we are uh, live in a sinful, fallen world and we're going to sin. But there's true repentance that we come back to and then we just continue to live and love like Jesus. Wow. 
and walk in obedience with him. Putting our trust in him. I did not want to be on stage today. I'll tell you that. But I walked in obedience for him, not pastor. I was actually mad at pastor. (laughs) It's like, dude, you're crazy. But we walk in obedience for the Lord. And it's not... uh, it's not for our gain, even though uh, the text said the, that there would be blessings, which really was just a joy that we walk in and aligning with his word. But it's because our loyalty is to Jesus. Our allegiance is to Jesus. And we just surround and, and, and orient our lives around walking in allegiance to Jesus. And... The, the text goes on and says in uh, 119.9, Young people, how can you stay pure? By guarding your, pu- your purity according to his word. Purity in today's world is a challenge, but we are, because we are bombarded with messages that contradict God's standards. The psalmist gives a clear answer. You can stay pure by living according to God's word. You don't have to give in to temptation. You don't have to give in to peer pressure. It, I mean, it's been almost 10 years now, but I remember when I was in high school, um, if you surround yourself with other like-minded people that are walking with Christ, staying pure is actually pretty easy. Wow. It's whenever you're off uh, living in sin and not surrounding yourself with people that are actually um, have your best interest in mind, that we start getting into sinful habits and natures and that the impurities start to just leak in and our hearts get uh, stained. And it can take a long time to purify that back out, especially in our youth, especially when we're young. I know purity isn't just uh, for young people, it's for adults too, but it's such a vital stage of your middle school and high school years of having a pure heart. And knowing his word protects your heart from anything that's trying to come in. It safeguards it against uh, the impurities of the world. It It keeps to go on, it says in verse 11, the psalmist says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we internalize scripture, it acts, it acts as a shield against temptation. It renews our minds and strengthens us to resist sin. Look at verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This imagery of light is powerful. In a dark world, God's word illuminates our path, showing us the way we should go. Not high beam, but low beam. It's just a step by step, day by day. It's the the daily disciplines and habits that we put in our life that that keep us in accordance with his word. Look at verse 162. I'm trying to hurry. I don't know where Taylor is, but... I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil... For the psalmist, discovering God's word was like finding a hidden treasure. He found immense joy in knowing and following God's commandments. The the world's going to offer us temporary pleasures, but the joy that comes from God's word is lasting. It's a joy that sustains us even when things aren't going well. It's a joy that shows up when maybe we're just not feeling that happy. But there's a joy that can still show up. It's a joy that shows up when we're just mad and angry. 
someone said something about us and we're just, we're letting it soak in and then we're sitting at home and it just keeps cycling and, and cycling. And then we start making up conversations that, that they had and then what they're thinking. And then they, they looked at me like that or they weren't paying attention or, and we just, we get into this cycle and it's day in and day out. And what the word's saying is that there's a, there's a joy to be found in just abiding in his word. To just meditating in it. When's the last time you meditated on his word? When's the last time we just took a, a scripture? We could have we just went today and just read Psalm 119 and just read it from beginning to end. That's what we should have done probably. <laughs> Honestly. Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, I just want to get in your word, and I want to read it, and I want to meditate it, on it. Joy for our people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joy for are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Consistently. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. There's so many just... Profound truths. The whole Bible is profound truth, but this Psalm 119, it's just like the pearl. So many truths as you read through these, and if you actually meditate on the words and what they're saying, it can change the way that you live and the way that you live your life. As our team was getting ready to head to Guatemala this week, I started digging through some old notebooks that I had. And I found one that I took with me to my very first mission trip to Honduras when I was 16. And uh, it was my first mission trip. And it was the first time I'd ever flown on a plane. And uh, not that that matters. It has nothing to do with this story. But um, this is this is what I, a little bit of what I wrote in that notebook the people here have nothing yet they're so happy worn out clothes some have shoes some don't everyone walks there aren't many vehicles the houses they stay in have no floors it's just dirt with some tin walls and a tin roof about the size of my bathroom back home But I still can't get over how joyful and happy all these people showed up tonight to our first chapel service, singing and dancing to worship. I didn't understand anything they were saying, but I couldn't keep from smiling. The people have nothing, but I think that's really the key. Very little money, resources, hardly the basic needs but also no cell phones, no electronics, no distractions. Their joy is found in the word of God. That's the joy I wanna live my life with. You don't realize how good you have it until you actually walk in someone else's shoes. But it actually seems like they have the secret of having it good. Lord, help me to hold tight to your words. Help me to love like the people here. Help me to always remember the genuine joy of the Honduras people who only have one thing, you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you for the word that uh, you provided today through your spirit. And Father, I pray that there would be a joy that we could be found in knowing and living in your word. 
a joy in aligning our lives to your word and to your will. My Father, I pray that if there's anything that we need to repent to you, Lord, that we would do it now. If there's anything that we've been holding on to that we need to give to you, Father, I pray that we would do that now. pray that we'd meditate on the truths of who you are. That Jesus was present in the beginning and that his, his presence was felt all through the Old Testament as, until his, his time to come in the New Testament, Lord, when he died for our sins. That he's risen again and the Spirit's been poured out into us. There's just a joy and just a a, a freedom that we get to live in because of what Jesus did on the cross. I pray that we would just recognize that. That we don't have to live in shame or guilt. That there's areas in our our lives, Lord, that you want to come in and take the sword of truth and slice away if we'll allow you to purify our hearts. There's people in our lives that you want us to disciple to, but we need to come and repent of our hearts first. Father, As we go throughout this week, Lord, give us eyes to see the lost. Give us ears to hear you and hear others better. To not only think about ourselves. And Father, let your spirit guide us in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything this morning, our prayer team is going to be right over here in the corner. Um, Go see them. They'd love to to pray for you and and speak life into you. And um, yeah, I think that's it. All right. Blessing. If you'd please stand. Let's speak this uh, over each other uh, loudly. Go, may the Lord. Be blessed. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.